Chapter 1 Prince Theodore of Farron swept through the capital's bustling streets with a purpose that matched his royal stride. Clad in casual attire, yet still exuding an air of nobility, he was on a quest that many would call him crazy for. He was looking for the woman he'd fallen in love with, through his painting and a canvas. She was no duchess or baroness, but a face in the crowd that had captured his artistic soul. Now, he sought her in reality, combing through the heart of his kingdom for a stranger who had unwittingly become his muse. As he approached the familiar patisserie, whose sense of fresh bread and sweet confections permeated the morning air, he steeled himself for the inevitable. The bell above the door chimed his arrival, announcing the presence of royalty. Your Highness, cooed a chorus of female voices. A bevy of young women, each more eager than the last, clustered around him, their smartphones held aloft ready to snap a picture of his ready smile. Would you grace us with a photo, Prince Theodore? One asked, her eyes aglow with the thrill of proximity to the kingdom's most eligible bachelor. Of course, he replied, the practiced smile of public charm gracing his lips as he obliged them. The flash of cameras punctuated the bakery like the flashes of paparazzi, though here, he was amongst his people, safe from the ravenous media. Thank you, your highness. You're so much more handsome in person, another exclaimed, her cheeks turning the shade of the raspberry tarts on display. Theodore nodded graciously, but his mind was elsewhere, scanning the room over the heads of his admirers. He searched for a glimpse of slate-colored irises, the unique hue that he had committed to memory and canvas. His gaze flitted from face to face, hopeful, expectant, but ultimately unfulfilled. Is there anything special you're looking for today, your highness? The baker inquired, noting the prince's distracted air. Something very special indeed, Theodore murmured, more to himself than to the inquisitive crowd. I would like one of your croissants with honey and butter. He'd had croissants from the small bakery many times in his life. I'll take it to go. He had no desire to be fond over as he ate. After paying for his treat, he gave a final nod to the gathering, and he excused himself. The crisp autumn air greeted him as he stepped back onto the cobbled streets. His search continued, driven by a yearning that was both uncharacteristic and unsettling. This was not the pursuit of a prince destined to rule, but of a man ensnared by the elusive promise of a connection that defied status and protocol. Today, however, the capital city of Theron remained a labyrinth with no end its pathways leading him ever onward, but never to her. Theodore's footsteps echoed softly as he crossed the threshold into a quaint café, its walls adorned with local artwork and the aroma of hearty broth wafting through the air. He removed his gloves with a practiced ease, placing them gently beside him as he seated himself at a corner table. The murmurs in the room hushed for a breath, only to swell again with discreet excitement. Your Highness, the waitress, curtsied slightly, her cheeks flushed with restrained enthusiasm. What can I get for you today? Just a bowl of your tomato basil soup, thank you, Theodore replied, offering a courteous smile. As she nodded and departed, he observed the other patrons, hearing snatches of conversations, and the quiet clink of spoons against bowls, but no gray eyes met his. Excuse me, Prince Theodore? A tentative voice reached him from a table nearby. He turned to see a young woman holding out her phone, her hand quivering ever so slightly. Could I, could we take a photo together? Of course, Theodore obliged without hesitation, rising from his seat. He leaned in slightly, granting her a gracious smile as the camera captured the moment. Returning to his solitude, he couldn't help but muse on the nature of such requests. They were never about duty or the weight of a crown, they were always light-hearted, seeking the warmth of his playful reputation. The soup arrived, steam curling upward like a dance, and Theodore thanked the waitress with a polite nod. As he savored the rich flavors, he allowed his thoughts to wander. It occurred to him that perhaps it was the very absence of responsibility that drew these women to him instead of James. To be seen with the fun prince, the charming rogue, it was a dalliance free from the inherent burdens of queendom. 
Somehow he'd always been the more popular prince, but now that his brother was married, he was more sought after than ever. Your brother is quite the statesman, an older gentleman at a neighboring table, commented. But you, sir, you bring joy to the people. Theodore chuckled softly, acknowledging the truth in the stranger's words. One must play the role assigned to him, he said. Ah, but even beneath the mask, your highness, you have a heart for the people, the gentleman raised his teacup in a subtle salute. That cannot be feigned. Thank you, Theodore responded, touched by the sincerity of the observation. As he finished his meal, the laughter and snapshots of his public persona felt like a mask he wore in public. And behind the mirthful mask lay a longing for the understanding of one very special woman. With a final spoonful, he pushed the bowl aside, his appetite for both food and this fruitless quest momentarily sated. Rising, he left payment on the table, a few extra coins for the waitress's trouble, and stepped back into the bustling city, where the whispers of his name followed him everywhere. Theodore emerged from the quaint warmth of the café and continued down the cobblestone streets of Theron. He resumed his stroll, with a sense of purpose yet weighed by an undercurrent of resignation. Prince Theodore, a young woman called out as she hastened her steps to catch up with him, her eyes alight with excitement. May I have a picture with you? Of course, he said, flashing his most charming smile as he obliged her request, though his gaze swiftly resumed its hunt. With each click of the camera shutter, he scanned the sea of faces drifting past him, searching for that singular pair of stormy gray eyes that haunted his dreams. Thank you, your highness. You're so much more handsome in person, the woman gushed, clutching her phone to her chest. Flattery will get you everywhere, he quipped, though his heart wasn't in the jest. He moved on, threading through the crowd, his royal bearing parting the people in his path. Arriving at the main park of the city, Theodore paused at its entrance, taking in the sight of the park in fall. Professionals lounged on benches, their laughter mingling with the rustle of leaves, children danced around the fountain, their innocent joy untainted by courtly intrigue. Prince Theodore, over here. A group of young office workers waved him over to their picnic blanket. May we be graced with your presence, your highness? one asked. Only for a moment, he replied, accepting the invitation with a gracious nod. Is it true that you've traveled to every continent? a man inquired, sandwich in hand. I have, Theodore answered, his attention subtly flitting from face to face his spirit undeterred by the elusive nature of his quest. Well, every continent but Antarctica, which is a place only for penguins. But no view compares to the vitality of Theron's. Spoken like a true prince, another praised. Theodore's focus momentarily caught on a pair of laughing eyes across the way, only to sigh inwardly when they revealed themselves to be of a common brown, not the rare gray he sought. Your Highness, you must tell us about your grandest adventure, a woman urged. Ah, my grandest adventure remains unwritten, he mused. His eyes continued their vigil, darting from one person to another, forever hopeful and perpetually disappointed. Your modesty is as renowned as your valor, the man chuckled. Modesty, perhaps, Theodore allowed himself a small smile, but my valor has yet to be truly tested. And as the lunch hour waned, so did the prince's resolve. The park's many faces blurred into a tableau of missed connections, none belonging to the woman who had unknowingly captured his heart with a mere glance. With a courteous bow, he excused himself from the company of the picnickers. Until we meet again, Prince Theodore, they called after him. Indeed, he whispered to himself. Until we meet again. Theodore stepped into the whimsical chaos of Mr. Pendleton's toy emporium, a place where childhood dreams were encased in glass and wood. The air was thick with the scent of varnish and the laughter of children. Bells jingled above the door, announcing his presence like a herald. His eyes swept the room, not for toys, but for those elusive gray orbs that haunted him. Your Highness, Mr. Pendleton himself, a rotund man with a bushy mustache, emerged from behind a shelf of intricately painted soldier figurines. 
What an honor. To what do we owe this pleasure? Good afternoon, Mr. Pendleton, Theodore replied with practiced affability. I'm merely perusing your collection. Ah, perhaps a gift for a niece or nephew? Pendleton suggested, his eyes twinkling. Not yet, but hopefully soon, the prince said. He knew the entire nation was waiting for his brother James and his wife, Amanda, to announce the impending arrival of the next generation of Theron royalty. Theodore focused his attention on the patrons, a mother herding two boisterous boys, and a young couple cooing over stuffed bears. Your Highness, if I may be so bold, Mr. Pendleton ventured, the rocking horses over there are a new import. Quite magnificent. Thank you, I shall take a look. Theodore obliged, his gait slow as he passed by rows of dolls with porcelain faces, none of which mirrored the visage he sought. His heart seemed to rock back and forth, just as the vacant horses did, swaying between hope and despondency. In the corner of the store, a little girl giggled as she hugged a rag doll, and for a fleeting moment, Theodore imagined a similar sound emanating from the woman he yearned for. He shook the thought away. Charming toys, indeed, Mr. Pendleton, he commented. Thank you, sir. We strive for nothing less than enchantment. Enchantment, Theodore echoed softly, pivoting on his heel, departing the emporium with a nod. Next, he found himself before the vibrant display of Mrs. Linton's candy shop. The saccharine aroma enveloped him as he pushed open the door, causing a tinkling melody to fill the small space. Jars of colorful confections lined the walls, their contents shimmering like jewels under the soft lighting. Prince Theodore. Mrs. Linton exclaimed. What a delightful surprise. Mrs. Linton, he greeted her. I trust business is sweet? Always, especially when you visit, she chirped, flitting about the counter. Perhaps some chocolate truffles? Or maybe our famed peppermint sticks? Perhaps. Theodore's gaze lingered on a jar of silver-wrapped candies. I would like a kilogram of these. He would give them to everyone in the palace. He had no taste for sweets. He only wanted to find the woman who haunted him. I'll get that ready right away. Would you like anything else? She asked. Thank you. Theodore smiled, though it failed to reach his eyes. That will be all for today. Of course, sir. Do come again. He nodded, stepping out onto the street where life flowed around him in a steady stream. He took a deep breath, the sugar-laden air of the shop replaced by the crispness of the outside world. In his chest, the weight of duty pressed heavily, yet it was the lightness of love unfound that propelled him forward. Continuing down the street, he stopped in front of a glass-blowing shop a place he liked to visit often. His artists I was always interested in the intricate baubles made there. The chime of the glass shop's doorbell announced Prince Theodore's entrance, a sound as clear and delicate as the myriad of creations that covered the shelves of the small shop. Good afternoon, your highness, greeted the master glassblower. He wiped his hands on his apron. Good afternoon, Theodore replied, his eyes roving over the elegant bases and intricate sculptures that lined the shelves, searching not for the artistry before him, but for the gray-eyed woman who had captured his heart through mere brushstrokes. Is there anything I can assist you with today? The glassblower's question pierced his reverie, pulling him back to the present. Perhaps, Theodore said, his fingers tracing the smooth curve of a sapphire vase. I'm looking for someone, a woman with eyes like the stormy sea. Ah, many come to watch the glass blowing. It's quite the spectacle, the man mused thoughtfully. But gray eyes. I'm afraid no one comes to mind. Thank you, anyway. Theodore nodded, his gaze lingering on a delicate glass rose, its petals frozen in time, untouchable yet yearning to be held. The journey next led him to the jewelry store a place of timeless treasures and sparkling allure. Prince Theodore. The jeweler welcomed him like an old friend. What brings you to our humble establishment? Merely browsing, Mrs. Hartley, 
he replied, allowing his gaze to sweep across the display cases glinting with diamonds and gold. Or perhaps looking for something more, specific, she ventured, a knowing twinkle in her eye as she gestured toward the engagement rings. You've been quite the topic of conversation among the ladies. Any chance you're finally ready to settle down? Ah, you are as perceptive as ever, Theodore began. But I'm afraid my heart is already spoken for, though I've yet to find the owner. Is that so? Mrs. Hartley leaned forward conspiratorially, her voice lowering to a playful whisper. And if you did find her, might you need an engagement ring, then? Perhaps this one? She presented a ring whose diamond center stone captured the light with a resolute sparkle. Perhaps, Theodore echoed, the word tinged with wistfulness. It's a beautiful piece, but it's the hand that wears it that will give it true meaning. Indeed, Mrs. Hartley agreed, her expression softening. She must be quite special to have won the heart of Farron's most eligible bachelor. More than you know, he replied. With a courteous nod, Theodore excused himself, knowing he needed to return home. There was a dinner party at the palace that night, and he was expected to be there, dressed in his finest. As he walked into the palace, he sighed. I'll find her tomorrow. Your Highness, greeted Sir Chamberlain. The kingdom has felt your presence today. Has it? Theodore's voice held the faintest trace of irony as he handed his coat to the waiting servant. I fear I've accomplished very little on its behalf. Nevertheless, the people are always heartened to see their prince amongst them, Sir Chamberlain assured him, his loyalty to the crown evident in his steadfast gaze. If I may say, you wear concern on your brow this eve. I simply need to get ready for the supper party. He couldn't let others worry about his quest to find his grey-eyed lady. As the silence enveloped him, he contemplated the spaces between his princely duties and the quiet yearning of his heart. The castle's walls, lined with the echoes of generations, seemed to close in, a reminder of the lineage he was bound to uphold. Where are you? he murmured. You exist beyond the canvas, beyond my dreams. You must. In the solitude of his chambers, Theodore dressed for the supper party. He had no desire to go, but he knew it was expected. And he always did what was expected of him. Tomorrow. I'll find you tomorrow. Chapter 2 A gentle hum of conversation enveloped Art Haven, a sanctuary in the bustling heart of Theron's capital. Framed by a whimsical facade of cobalt blue and sunflower yellow, the gallery was an oasis amidst the steel and glass of the cityscape. Inside, the walls were adorned with artistry, paintings, sculptures, and installations each telling their own silent tale. Nicole Winters moved through the crowd with the grace of a seasoned hostess, wearing a chic black dress. She was the heartbeat of the gallery, her warm smile serving as both an invitation and a comfort. As she flitted from one patron to another, Nicole's thoughts often meandered to the depths of the canvas, to the strokes of bristles that bore emotions and danced with color. Her mind occasionally drifted toward the enigmatic Peter Thompson, whose work she had admired from afar, their layers and textures igniting a spark of wonder within her. Have you heard about Thompson's latest series? A voice pulled her back to the present. Only whispers and rumors, Nicole confessed, tucking a stray lock of dark hair behind her ear. But I've seen enough of his work to know he's a master at capturing the essence of his subject. Enigmatic as always, chuckled another guest. The man knows how to shroud himself in mystery. True, but it's the art that should speak, isn't it? The artist is just the vessel, Nicole replied. Nicole's fingertips traced the contours of a bronze sculpture, her touch reverent and discerning. Art Haven pulsed with creative energy. Each artwork was a testament to someone's vision, carefully chosen to provoke thought and stir emotion among those who wandered through this sanctuary in the heart of Theron's capital. Nicole, how do you do it? asked Marianne, one of the regulars. Nicole replied, it's about seeing the world not only as it is, but as it could be. 
These artists, she gestured inclusively, they have voices that need to be heard, stories that demand to be told. Indeed, Marianne murmured. Take this piece, Nicole continued, guiding Marianne to a canvas. The artist spent months observing urban sunsets from rooftops all over the city to capture the fleeting moments just before twilight. Remarkable dedication, Marianne observed. Exactly, Nicole affirmed. And it's my duty to ensure such dedication doesn't go unnoticed. As she walked through the gallery, Nicole's eyes shone with a fervor that betrayed her innermost thoughts. Here, amidst these creations, she felt the thrill of unearthing hidden gems. Have you seen the work of the new sculptor I've been raving about? Nicole asked a group of patrons gathered there. Her medium is reclaimed metal, and what she does with it, it's nothing short of transformative. Sounds fascinating, one of the guests responded. Oh, it is, Nicole said, her mind already racing with plans for the sculptor's exhibition. She reinvents the discarded and shapes it into something meaningful, something alive. Every time I find an artist whose work resonates with me, I'm reminded of why I started Art Haven. Your enthusiasm is infectious, a guest told her. Perhaps, Nicole conceded, her lips curving upward. But it's not without reason. Art has the power to change us, to reflect our humanity at us. For Nicole, each successful exhibition was a promise fulfilled, a dream realized, not just for the artists, but for herself as well. Nicole called out Albert, one of her trusted assistants, his voice carrying over the conversation that animated the gallery. Have you heard about Peter Thompson's latest exhibition? Her hand paused, a tingle of intrigue quickening her pulse. Peter Thompson, she echoed, the name emerging like a secret she longed to uncover. Of course, his work is a hot topic in artistic circles. Yes, Albert agreed, adjusting his glasses. But it's his mysterious nature that has everyone talking. He doesn't even go to his own openings. An artist shrouded in mystery, Nicole mused aloud. His pieces are captivating. I've seen them in other galleries, you know. Yet no one seems to have met the man himself, Albert remarked. True, Nicole replied, her thoughts adrift. Her gallery was a testament to visibility, the artists became family, their stories as much a part of the exhibit as the art itself. But Thompson? He never showed his face. Wouldn't it be something, Albert said, breaking into her reverie, if Art Haven could host a Peter Thompson exhibition? Something indeed, she whispered, the corner of her mouth lifting in a wistful smile. Perhaps one day our paths will cross, Nicole said. For now, let's ensure that every artist we showcase feels seen and celebrated. Of course, Albert concurred, nodding as he moved away to attend to an eager patron. Nicole allowed herself a moment to stare into the group of patrons there. Each person here was a potential connection, a link to untold stories and unseen worlds. She shook her head slightly, marveling at the web of relationships that formed the tapestry of her life's work. Peter Thompson, she said. One day the mystery would unravel, she was certain. And when it did, she'd be there, ready to extend a hand to the elusive man, ready to welcome him into the fold. Have you seen Solitude in Bloom? Nicole asked a couple near her. It's one of Thompson's pieces. The way he encapsulates the paradox of loneliness amid beauty, it's truly amazing. The woman nodded. Yes, the contrast between the stark white lily and the encroaching shadows, it's haunting. As if the flower is both yearning for the light and resigned to the darkness. His use of shadow and light, Nicole mused aloud, is not merely a technique. With Thompson, it becomes a language. She gestured, shaping the air as if she could physically mold the concepts she described. A language that speaks directly to the soul, without need for translation. Indeed, a gentleman with salt and pepper hair chimed in, adjusting his glasses as though to better visualize the artistry they discussed. And what about the final note? That piece where the violin's bow rests eternally on the final string, so laden with unspoken finality. 
Ah, yes, Nicole agreed, her voice a whisper. That painting stayed with me for days. It's as though Thompson understands the weight of silence, the heavy pause, that follows a life-altering sentence. Each stroke conveys the sense of an ending, but also the beauty of what has been. His work is more than paint on canvas, an enthusiastic young man added. It's an exploration of human experience. Exactly, Nicole said. There's something universal in his themes, despite the uniqueness of his style. He's a master of weaving the personal into the profoundly relatable. Miss Nicole, the salt and pepper gentleman began, your passion for his work is evident. Have you ever considered reaching out to him? His work would be quite at home here. Believe me, I've thought about it more times than I can count, Nicole confessed, a rueful smile touching her lips. Her fingers brushed against the silver locket she wore, a habit when contemplation held her in its grasp. But Thompson is something of an enigma. I would love the opportunity to showcase his art, to give it the platform it deserves. Who knows, she said, half to herself, maybe one day the universe will conspire in our favor. Her eyes sparkled with the prospect, and in that moment, Nicole was more than a curator, she was a dreamer, standing on the precipice of possibility. With purposeful strides, Nicole moved through the gallery, adjusting lighting here, straightening a frame there. Her hands were never idle, nor was her mind as she ran through the checklist of administrative duties that awaited her attention. Emails from aspiring artists seeking representation, phone calls to be returned, and paperwork to be filed. It was never-ending. Today's agenda, she said, pulling a planner toward her and flipping it open, is the final arrangement for next week's exhibition. Everything must be perfect. The gallery was her domain, and she ruled it with a benevolent hand, fostering creativity and passion in equal measure. Nicole, came a voice from the doorway, breaking her focus. It was Maria, her assistant, holding a stack of mail. These just arrived for you. Thank you, Maria. Any word from Mr. Donovan about the lighting fixtures? Nicole queried, taking the mail and scanning through it. He'll have them installed by tomorrow afternoon, Maria replied with an efficient nod. Excellent. Nicole's eyes caught on a particular envelope. It was an invitation to an exclusive art auction, one where rumors hinted that a piece by Peter Thompson might make a rare appearance. Maria, hold all my calls, for the next hour, Nicole instructed, her tone decisive yet tinged with anticipation. I have some research to do. Of course, Nicole. Maria retreated, leaving Nicole to her contemplations. As she perused the rest of her mail, Nicole's mind wandered back to the prospect of crossing paths with Peter Thompson. Each stroke of his brush seemed to call out to her, inviting her into a world shrouded in mystery, yet achingly familiar. Peter Thompson, Nicole whispered, a resolute spark igniting within her. One way or another, our worlds will collide. Her thoughts shifted, turning inward. In the solitude of the gallery, Nicole permitted herself to touch upon her own hidden aspirations, the brushstrokes she kept confined within the pages of a sketchbook tucked away in her office drawer. There were moments, like filaments of light through a prism, when she felt the pull to create rather than cure it. Nicole? The voice of Maria, the assistant who'd returned to lock up, interrupted her reverie. Will you be joining us for the staff dinner tonight? Ah, yes, of course. Nicole straightened as she slipped on her coat. Duty calls, after all. Who knows, she mused, glancing back at the darkened windows of Art Haven. Maybe he'll walk through those doors, and everything will change. Or maybe, she continued silently, a determined gleam in her eye, I'll be the one to change everything. Chapter 3 In his private studio in the palace, Prince Theodore stood motionless, before his easel. The only sound was the soft scrape of bristles across the canvas, the prince's hand moving with the kind of precision that spoke of years of painting. This latest piece, a portrait bathed in light, was shaping up to be his magnum opus, each detail a testament to his unyielding dedication. 
remarkable, came a voice from the doorway, and Theodore glanced up to find King Albert standing in the doorway. Father, Theodore greeted, the formality of his tone undercut by the warmth of their shared smile. Do you think it's good enough? Without question, the king affirmed, stepping closer to study the canvas. Your talent continues to astound me. Theodore's brush paused mid-stroke, and he considered his father's words, feeling the weight of expectation and the thrill of meeting it. His art defined him, even if only his family understood that he was the one who crafted the beautiful pieces. Queen Beatrice glided into the room next, her grace undiminished by time. Theodore, your work brings such life to this old palace, she said. Thank you, mother, Theodore replied, his brush resuming its dance. I endeavor to capture beauty as you have always taught me. Speaking of beauty, James chimed in as he sauntered in trailed by Eloise, whose curious eyes darted around the studio, Amanda insists you've outdone yourself this time. Our brother's skill is unrivaled, Eloise added, closing the distance, to stand shoulder to shoulder with their mother. Yes, Amanda agreed, entering last. You paint as if the very soul of the subject is at your command. Theodore felt a surge of gratitude for his family's unwavering support. If my paintings can reflect even a fraction of the love coming from you all, then I'm a success. Success is yours already, my boy, King Albert declared. But remember, duty calls as well. Of course, father, Theodore acknowledged, his mind briefly clouding with the duality of his existence, prince and painter, duty and desire. Asterisk. Another masterpiece finds its home, Nicole murmured, stepping back to admire the alignment. Nicole, the lighting here is divine, commended an admirer, his voice echoing lightly off the high ceilings. Thank you, Martin, she replied. Art deserves to be seen in the best light. As she drifted from piece to piece, ensuring each was showcased to perfection, the gallery door opened behind her. Prince Theodore stepped inside his presence bold yet unassuming, his attire impeccably tailored, a silent testament to his royal lineage. But today, he was simply a patron, a lover of art. His eyes scanned the room, pausing, admiring, until they found her. Nicole, unaware of the prince's scrutiny, continued her work, while Theodore's heart sped up. She was the living embodiment of the woman who haunted his canvas at home, her cheekbones, the curve of her neck, the way her hair tumbled in chestnut waves. Excuse me, Theodore said, approaching her, his voice steady, betraying none of his inner tumult. Your gallery is a treasure trove. Nicole turned toward him, her eyes briefly widening in recognition of his presence. Thank you, your royal highness. We strive to inspire and evoke. Indeed, you succeed admirably, Theodore remarked, his gaze lingering on her face trying to imprint every detail. Her presence stirred something within him, a connection that transcended the mere physical likeness to his muse. Is there a particular style that interests you? She inquired, unaware of the thoughts racing through Theodore's mind. Portraiture, primarily, he admitted, the truth slipping out wrapped in the guise of casual interest. The human form, the soul captured in a moment, it's compelling. Ah, then you'll find our upcoming exhibit enthralling, Nicole said, gesturing toward a promotional flyer. It's a celebration of the modern portrait. She couldn't remember anyone from the royal family ever gracing her gallery with their presence, and she couldn't help the clamminess of her palms or the nerves having him there shot through her body. Sounds fascinating, Theodore replied, his voice smooth as velvet. He observed her movements, her eloquent hands articulating her words. Will you be attending? She asked, a strand of hair falling gracefully over her shoulder. A pause hung between them, pregnant with possibility, before Theodore answered, I would be delighted. They shared a smile, a fleeting connection that bridged the gap between stranger and acquaintance. In that moment, Prince Theodore had found a kindred spirit in her that seemed to lighten the weight of his dual life. Yet, duty beckoned, and with a silent promise to return, he bid her farewell, stepping back into the sunlight with a new purpose flickering in his chest. 
Art has a way of speaking directly to the soul, doesn't it? Theodore mused aloud. It does, Nicole agreed. Her gaze lingered on the canvas, tracing the contours of painted hills with a reverence reserved for sacred things. Each artist has their language, and if we listen closely, we can hear their stories. Stories that often remain untold, he added thoughtfully. He felt the pull of his own concealed narrative, tightly wound within the pseudonym Peter Thompson. True, she nodded. But sometimes, it's the mystery that captivates us. Are you drawn to any particular story today? Theodore inquired, wishing everyone in their land didn't automatically recognize him as royalty. Actually, yes, Nicole confessed. This collection speaks of resilience, of beauty found in the depths of struggle. Quite touching. Resilience is a powerful theme, he commented, his words carefully measured. It resonates with a quiet strength that many aspire to possess. Exactly, she beamed. And to think, the artist who captures such emotion remains an enigma, Peter Thompson, isn't it? She glanced at him. Ah, yes, Thompson, Theodore replied smoothly, the name feeling foreign on his tongue. A rather reclusive character, I hear. Reclusive, perhaps, but his work, it's as if he understands the very essence of existence, Nicole said, her admiration for the mysterious artist evident. Perhaps one day he'll step out from the shadows, Theodore suggested wistfully, allowing himself a moment to dream of a world where titles didn't define him. It was the reason he painted with a pseudonym. He didn't want people to buy his work simply because he was a prince. Perhaps, Nicole echoed. They continued their walk, side by side, their conversation weaving between the philosophical and the mundane, each sentence adding another layer to their burgeoning connection. And though Theodore spoke with ease, his mind was a tumultuous sea, churning with the clash of duty and desire. As they approached the end of the exhibit, Theodore's mind raced as he tried to come up with a way to see her again. Would you ever consider attending a royal ball? Her laughter was tinged with apprehension. I'm afraid that's not quite my thing. The spotlight has a way of distorting the true picture. Understandable, he conceded, a shadow of disappointment crossing his features. There's an artist I'm trying hard to find so I can display his work here in my gallery. Peter Thompson has a way of capturing the essence of a moment, Nicole mused, her voice hushed with reverence. It's as if he sees through to the soul of his subjects. Absolutely, Theodore replied. He paints with an honesty that is very rare in this world. Nicole turned toward him, her eyes seeking his with genuine curiosity. And what about you, your highness? Do you find yourself moved by his work? Very much so, he confessed, the truth coming easily, despite the identity he cloaked himself in. His pieces resonate with something deep within me. A kindred spirit, perhaps. Their gazes locked, and for a heartbeat, the world seemed to shrink until it was just the two of them. Artistic souls are often drawn to one another, Nicole said softly. Are you suggesting we share an artistic soul? Theodore teased, enjoying the light dance of flirtation. Perhaps, she countered with a playful tilt of her head. Or maybe it's simply the recognition of passion in another. Passion can be a powerful thing, he agreed. Indeed, it can lead us down unexpected paths. She moved closer to him, and his heart beat faster. They weren't quite touching, but he could feel the warmth radiating from her body. Paths we might be wise to explore, he murmured. Nicole smiled. With the right guide, I imagine those paths could be quite enlightening. Then let us hope we find such guides, Theodore said, feeling the pull of duty warring with the desire to remain lost in this intimate world. Let us hope, Nicole echoed, her gaze lingering before drifting back to the paintings. Theodore's heart thrummed a steady beat of loyalty to his name, but in the quiet space of the gallery, surrounded by the silent witnesses of art's power, he felt the stirrings of a different allegiance, an allegiance to the emotions Nicole evoked within him. Are you certain a ball at the palace is out of the question? 
Her eyes, reflecting the depths of an evening sky awaiting its first star, met his with a gentle firmness. Prince Theodore, I'm flattered, truly. But I fear the spotlight that follows you might be too intense for my liking. He saw the resolve in her stance, the slight tilt of her chin that spoke volumes of her independence. It was part of what drew him to her, this strength that needed no crown to prove its worth. Understandable, he conceded, the words careful, measured like the strokes of his brush. But know that the night would shimmer all the brighter with your presence. Nicole's lips curved into a smile. I am but a keeper of art, your highness, not one who wishes to stand beside it, painted in the public eye. However, if anyone were able to tempt her away from her world, it would be him. His strength and devotion to art drew her to him in a way no man ever had. Perhaps another time then, he offered, every syllable laced with the quiet hope that such a time would come. Perhaps, she echoed, her gaze lingering on his face for a moment longer than necessary before retreating to the sanctuary of the canvases. As Theodore exited the gallery, the heavy door closing behind him felt like the ceiling of a tome filled with unwritten chapters. Alone, his footsteps echoed in the emptying streets, rhythmic and contemplative. With each step, he wrestled with the two layers of his existence, the prince of their nation and the man who longed to exist beyond it. His mind, a tempest of duty and desire, sought refuge in thoughts of how to be part of Nicole's world without subjecting her to his. Prince Theodore's resolve deepened, a silent vow, to find a path to her side that neither title nor expectation could tarnish. Now that he'd found her, there was no way he could possibly let her go. He would make a plan and go back to her. Perhaps offering to set up an exhibit with his friend Peter Thompson would work. Chapter 4 The clang of the gallery door announced Prince Theodore's arrival. Nicole glanced up from her careful study of a potential buyer's query, her eyes finding the familiar form of Theodore striding toward her, his bearing unmistakably noble, despite his casual attire. For just a moment, Nicole thought about what it would be like to be the woman on his arm. The one he looked at with those soulful green eyes. The one he cherished. But then she shook her head, reminding herself of all the reasons she'd refused to date him in the first place. Nicole, Theodore greeted. I find myself unable to let our last conversation reach its untimely conclusion. Prince Theodore, she replied, setting aside her paperwork with a grace that mirrored his own. What brings you back to my humble establishment? Not that she was disappointed to see him. She could work every day with a statue of him right in front of her to admire. Peter Thompson, he said simply, watching his recognition and surprise danced across her delicate features. You mentioned your interest in showcasing his work exclusively. I have decided to mediate on your behalf. Truly? Her lips parted slightly, and she resisted the urge to jump up and down and squeal like a schoolgirl. But why? You hardly know me. Because, Theodore began, pausing to choose his words with the same precision he would use to select the perfect brushstroke, I believe in the power of art to transcend. And I believe in your vision for this gallery. Nicole leaned against the cool marble of the display pedestal. That's incredibly generous of you. But Peter Thompson is notorious for being reclusive. How do you even know him? Ah, Theodore exhaled softly. Let us say that Mr. Thompson and I have crossed paths in ways that art and life often intertwine. I assure you, he will be more than willing to discuss terms once I've spoken to him. Then I am in your debt, your highness. Nicole's tone was light, teasing, yet her eyes held a glimmer of something deeper. Thank you for your belief in me and my small gallery. I will not forget this. Please, no debts between us, Theodore insisted, his hand gesturing dismissively. Consider it, a collaboration born of mutual appreciation for the arts. Collaboration, she echoed, testing the word and its implications. Well then, I look forward to what this partnership might bring. As do I, he replied, the unspoken promise hanging in the air. Theodore watched as Nicole returned to her desk. 
He noted the way her fingers lingered over the portfolios, the reverence with which she treated each piece, a curator not only by trade, but by calling. It was a trait he found both admirable and dangerous, for it pulled at something within him he wasn't quite ready to name. Shall we begin planning? Nicole asked. By all means, Theodore agreed. Let us make this exhibit one for the annals of artistic achievement. As they delved into the details of themes and logistics, Theodore couldn't help but observe how easily their thoughts aligned, how naturally conversation flowed. Perhaps a retrospective theme? Theodore suggested. Thompson's evolution as an artist laid bare on these walls. Chronological or thematic? Nicole countered, turning to meet his gaze. Thematic, he asserted. It offers a more compelling story. Agreed. She nodded. As Nicole paced the length of the gallery, Theodore followed her movements, noting the grace in her steps. He could already see the space transformed, Thompson's vibrant hues and daring strokes adorning the walls, a testament to the power of art to evoke emotion. Nicole, Theodore began, pausing as if to weigh each word, I find myself quite taken with your dedication. It is a rare thing to encounter someone so thoroughly connected to their craft. Is that so? She replied. Well, Prince Theodore, you aren't exactly a stranger to passion yourself. I've seen the way you speak of art, like it's a part of you. Theodore offered a half-smile, the compliment landing close to his heart. One could argue it is, he admitted. Then we're not so different, you and I, Nicole said, stepping closer. True, our shared ardor for art makes us quite compatible collaborators, he managed to say. Collaboration can lead to unexpected outcomes, Nicole quipped. Indeed, it can, Theodore agreed, the double entendre hanging between them like an unfinished masterpiece awaiting its final brushstroke. Shall we select specific works now? Nicole asked. Of course, he replied. As they leaned over the material, their shoulders brushed lightly, sending a current of awareness through him. Peter's early work is quite raw, don't you think? Nicole mused, pointing to an image of a stark, abstract piece. She seemed to have a photograph of every painting he'd ever done there. Raw, yet brimming with promise, Theodore noted. He was finding it rather fun to discuss his paintings, as if he was a stranger who was only casually acquainted with them. Much like us, she added softly. Exactly. Theodore cleared his throat. Let us ensure this show captures the essence of Thompson's journey. Nicole echoed. We're going to be at this for a while. Shall I have lunch brought in for us? Theodore nodded. That would be nice. Nicole made a quick call, ordering lunch to be brought to them. As they waited, Theodore gazed out of the window, lost in his thoughts. The task at hand was immense, capturing the essence of Thompson's journey meant delving deep into the heart of human emotions. As the delivery arrived, and Nicole set the table with plates of sandwiches and bowls of steaming soup, Theodore's mind began to wander into Thompson's world. With lunch finally served, Theodore and Nicole began discussing their approach. They agreed on the importance of capturing the vivid landscapes and extraordinary encounters that Thompson had experienced. But equally crucial was conveying the inner turmoil and growth that occurred along the way. Theodore told her some of his journey as an artist, carefully speaking in third person the entire time so she wouldn't realize that he was Thompson. It was difficult, but he had a feeling that as much as the prince seemed to be unappealing to her, the artist would be her idea of the perfect man. Modern Renaissance, she suggested, breaking the hush of the room as she unfurled a vibrant poster concept onto the table. A melding of classic and contemporary. It feels fitting for Thompson's style. Quite fitting, Theodore conceded, tapping his chin thoughtfully. His fingers itched to reach out and straighten the corner of the poster Nicole had missed, but he restrained himself, focusing instead on the details at hand. Though we should consider how to weave a narrative through the exhibit. Clusters could provide more context, Nicole mused, flipping through images of paintings. 
Dreams and Reality, Light and Shadow, themes that resonate with Thompson's work. You're right, Theodore remarked. And for logistics, opening night will need to be impeccable. We'll require security, caterers, and a guest list curated as meticulously as the exhibit itself. Curated, Nicole repeated, savoring the word. She placed the painting back into the folder and turned to Theodore. You have a way with words, your highness. One might think you're more poet than prince. Titles often belie the truth beneath, he replied. The intensity of their shared endeavor was thrilling, yet he couldn't ignore the twinge of apprehension in his chest. Was it the prospect of the event's success, or the fear of his heart becoming too entangled with Nicole's? Nicole leaned closer, her scent infiltrating his senses. What about interactive installations, she proposed. We could invite the audience to participate, to leave their mark alongside Thompson's. Interactive, he echoed, his voice trailing off. He imagined the gallery alive with conversation and laughter, the walls adorned with the stories of those who wandered among them. Your Highness, she prompted, a teasing tone threading through her words, bringing him back to the moment. Ah, yes, interactive pieces would add another dimension. He cleared his throat, regaining his composure. An excellent idea, Nicole. Thank you, she said, meeting his gaze with a smile that seemed to hold a challenge. I believe we're crafting something truly exceptional here. Exceptional indeed, Theodore murmured, mentally adding much like the woman before me though the words remained unspoken. His duty to the crown, the art, and the stirring of his heart formed a complex tapestry he was still learning to navigate. Shall we discuss the promotion of the exhibit next? Nicole asked, her hands laying out papers in order, outlining a marketing strategy. Sure, he agreed, his mind refocusing on the task. They delved into the intricacies of publicity, each suggestion from Nicole sparking further inspiration within him. Their collaboration was seamless, two minds united by a passion for art, a passion that, for Theodore, was quickly expanding beyond the confines of canvas and critique. When he returned the following day, he walked through the quiet gallery, before opening. Imagine, Theodore began, the opening night, these halls teeming with enthusiasts, each piece igniting conversation. Nicole laughed, her eyes shining. And imagine me, trying not to spill wine on any dignitary out of sheer nervousness. Perish the thought, he chuckled. You'll be the epitome of grace, I'm certain. There's no way that will happen if you invite your family. I'm not sure I could remain calm if the king was in my gallery, she said, mockingly holding out her skirt as if curtsying, nearly tripping over a roll of tape in the process. They both burst into laughter, the sound resonating amidst the future masterpieces. Ah, Nicole, Theodore said, catching her elbow to steady her, your humor is as refreshing as a Monet in a sea of somber Rembrandts. Speaking of somber, Nicole segued, her tone suddenly more serious, I sometimes fear this show won't live up to expectations. Mine, yours, the public's. His gaze found hers, earnest and understanding. As do I. But then, fear can be an excellent motivator. It reminds us we care deeply about our endeavors. True, she conceded. And what of your fears, your highness? Do you ever fear that, well, that your passion for art overshadows your royal duties? Every day, he admitted, vulnerability flashing across his features. Yet, without passion, duty becomes a mere shell of obligation. Art fills that shell with meaning. Profound, Nicole mused, her lips twitching with suppressed amusement. But does it fill the shell when you're deciding on tax reforms or attending another interminable state dinner? Those things are my brother's job, he confided with a dramatic sigh. In my mind, every policy debate is indeed a lively discussion on de Gasse's use of color. Or lack thereof in those dinners overcooked vegetables, she quipped, grinning at him. Touché, Theodore responded, his smile deepening. Theodore surveyed the gallery, envisioning the space transformed by their collective vision. 
He saw beyond the canvases, to the people they would touch, the emotions they would stir. The anticipation shimmered in the air around them, a tangible presence. Nicole, I believe we are on the cusp of something extraordinary, he declared with fervor, sweeping his arm, to encompass the room. Her eyes met his, alight with shared excitement. We are, aren't we? She stepped forward, clasping her hands in front of her, the blueprint of their aspirations laid bare between them. It will be a night to remember. Indeed, one for the annals of history, or at least the cultural column of the times, he added with a wry grin. Let's aim for both, she shot back, her enthusiasm infectious. Both it shall be, he agreed, the unspoken promise hanging in the air, like a sacred vow. Their laughter mingled once more, a prelude to the triumphs to come, as dedication and desire intertwined, heralding the dawn of a masterpiece not only on canvas, but within their very souls. Chapter 5 As Nicole adjusted a spotlight with meticulous care, the door opened with a gentle creak, announcing Prince Theodore's arrival. Good morning. I trust everything is coming together smoothly? Theodore's voice was a smooth baritone that filled the space, both authoritative and warm. Nicole turned, her posture straightening instinctively. Your Highness, she greeted with a respectful nod, her gaze taking in his tailored suit that fit him as if it were a second skin, every inch the modern prince. Yes, we're right on schedule. Just a few minor adjustments left. Please, call me Theodore when we are alone, he insisted, his smile genuine. I feel rather out of place surrounded by such creativity. Titles seem ridiculous here. Her lips quirked up at the corners, an involuntary reaction. Well then, Theodore, let me show you the layout. Nicole gestured toward the gallery blueprint spread across a table. They leaned over the plans, their heads close enough that she caught a hint of his cologne, an understated blend of citrus and cedarwood. It was surprisingly personal, a stark contrast to the grandeur that usually shrouded him. She pointed to various spots on the diagram, her finger tracing the flow of the exhibition's path. The centerpiece will be displayed there, drawing the eye immediately. Ah, strategic placement. I appreciate the thoughtfulness behind it, he remarked. You have an exceptional eye for detail, Nicole. Thank you, she replied, heartened by his praise. Their hands brushed accidentally over the blueprint, sending an unexpected jolt through her. A shared glance acknowledged the moment, fleeting yet charged. Shall we inspect the centerpiece? Theodore suggested a twinkle of mirth in his eyes. Of course, Nicole agreed, leading the way. As they walked side by side, they discussed the nuances of the artwork, their conversation flowing effortlessly. With each passing moment, the initial formality between them melted away, leaving room for something more akin to companionship. Nicole found herself captivated by his insights, each observation revealing a depth she hadn't anticipated from royalty. Your understanding of art is impressive, she said, a genuine smile lighting her face. One might mistake you for a fellow artist rather than loyalty. Ah, but artistry can be found in many aspects of life, not just on canvas, Theodore replied, matching her smile with one of his own. Leading a nation has its creative moments, albeit less colorful ones. Their laughter echoed through the gallery, a harmonious sound that seemed to weave around the sculptures and paintings. Nicole couldn't remember the last time she had felt so at ease with someone, especially someone as inherently untouchable as Theodore. Who knew planning an art show could be so invigorating, she mused aloud. It certainly hadn't been with other clients. There was just something special about Prince Theodore. How she wished he wasn't the same man who lived in the public light. Indeed, he concurred, his voice laced with a warmth that suggested the pleasure was mutual. It's been a while since I've enjoyed such lively banter. You, Nicole, are quite refreshing. The compliment hung in the air between them, heavy with unspoken implications. Nicole felt a blush creep up her neck, thankful for the dim lighting that might hide her reaction. 
Her heart fluttered in her chest, a sensation both unfamiliar and exhilarating. She had to wonder how much of his reputation had been earned, and how much had come simply because he was a prince. Thank you, Theodore, she managed, her voice steady, despite the turmoil within. I find your company equally refreshing. They shared a knowing look. In the sanctity of the gallery, surrounded by expressions of passion and beauty, the seeds of something new and thrilling took root. The prince and the curator, worlds apart yet somehow, in that moment, perfectly aligned. The grandeur of the gallery's high ceiling loomed above them, a mosaic of golden flecks dancing across its expanse as the setting sun cast its final rays through the tall windows. Nicole watched Theodore, his silhouette framed by the fading light, as he gestured toward an ornate oil painting, its subject a young boy with a regal bearing. Is that, she began, her voice trailing off in reverence. Yes, Theodore replied, a note of nostalgia threading through his words. That's me at seven, the age I was first taught the gravity of duty over oneself. Nicole stepped closer, examining the portrait. The boy wore a ceremonial uniform, his posture perfect, yet his eyes held a whisper of longing for something beyond the palace walls. Growing up in the palace, Theodore continued, his gaze fixed on the portrait, is a tapestry of tradition and obligation. Every footstep echoes with the weight of generations. He turned to face her, his expression earnest. It's beautiful and stifling, all at once. Must have been hard, she said softly, her eyes meeting his. It was, he admitted, his shoulders seeming to bear an invisible mantle but it teaches you to cherish those fleeting moments of freedom. Freedom, Nicole whispered, the word resonating within her. She thought of her own pursuit, a life painted in strokes of determination and shades of sacrifice. I understand that. My upbringing was far from palatial, but art, it demanded everything of me. Theodore regarded her with a newfound respect. You built quite a world for yourself, Nicole. That requires strength and courage. Courage sometimes feels like foolishness in disguise, she confessed, a rueful smile, curving her lips. There were nights when my passion seemed more like a curse than a calling. Yet here you stand, Theodore observed, stepping closer. Your dedication brought you here, to this very moment. Her heart skipped a beat, aware of his proximity, the air charged with unspoken words. Their lives, disparate in circumstance, were united in the pursuit of something greater than themselves. Thank you, Theodore, she said. For seeing that in me. Likewise, he replied, his voice hushed. For understanding the chains that bind even a prince. In the quiet aftermath of their confessions, they stood side by side. Together in a room full of timeless art, they were two souls reaching across the divide of their worlds, finding solace in the shared canvas of their dreams. Tell me, Theodore began, his tone gentle as he set down his cup with a soft clink against the saucer. What is it that you dream of when the world falls silent? She wrapped her hands tighter around her mug, the heat seeping into her palms. I dream of a place where peace prevails, she murmured thoughtfully where no one tries to hurt another because of the color of their skin or their religion. An admirable vision, Theodore commended, a hint of wonder lacing his voice. He watched her with an intensity that made her pulse quicken. Your turn, she prodded, her lips curving into a teasing smile. What does our prince dream of? When he spoke, his voice carried the weight of unfulfilled yearnings. I dream of freedom, he confessed, his eyes meeting hers with a vulnerability that took her breath away. To step beyond the palace gates and embark on an adventure not written for me by birthright but chosen by heart. Nicole leaned forward, captivated by the honesty in his words. His dreams echoed her own, a longing to break free from the expectations that tethered them. Perhaps, she said, her voice soft yet steady, we are more alike than we realized, Theodore. I believe so, he agreed, a playful glimmer dancing in his eyes. He reached into his jacket pocket and withdrew a small piece of paper, carefully folded. 
I was inspired by our shared sentiments. He extended the sketch toward her, and Nicole unfolded it with delicate fingers. Her breath hitched as her eyes fell upon the lines and curves that composed her portrait. It was her, undoubtedly, but seen through a lens of such profound attention that she could scarcely believe it was how he perceived her. Is this how you see me? she asked, all coloring her tone. Through my eyes, yes. Theodore's admitted. But more importantly, it's how you've revealed yourself today. Strong, passionate, and utterly captivating. Nicole felt a blush creep up her cheeks, her heart fluttering like a captive bird. The intimacy of the moment wrapped around them, as tangible as the artworks that bore silent witness to their burgeoning connection. Thank you, she whispered, unsure if her gratitude was for the sketch or for the sensation of being truly seen. This means more than you could imagine. Then it has fulfilled its purpose, he replied. They sat there, amidst the echoes of past artists' triumphs, sharing in the quiet triumph of understanding each other's deepest aspirations. Nicole sipped her coffee, the rich flavor grounding her as Theodore's presence enveloped her in a sense of promise, a promise of future dreams entwined and perhaps, one day, realized together. Nicole turned the sketch over in her hands, the texture of the paper a tactile reminder of the thoughtfulness behind Theodore's gift. To her it was more than a sketch, it was someone seeing her true self. Your talent is undeniable, she murmured, tracing a finger over the lines that defined her on the page. To capture so much with so few strokes, it's remarkable. Theodore watched her from across the small table they shared. He leaned back in his chair, the picture of ease, but there was an intensity in his gaze that hinted at the depth of his passion for art, and perhaps for the woman before him. Art, like life, is about capturing moments, he mused. It's about seeing the truth that lies beneath the surface. Nicole felt her heart thrum a steady beat, a rhythm set to the cadence of their conversation. She clasped the sketch gently, as though it were as fragile as the moment itself. Her thoughts danced a delicate ballet, twirling between admiration and the whisper of something deeper, a connection that threaded through her being like a silver filament. Seeing truth requires not only skill, but also empathy, she replied, meeting his gaze squarely. You have both in abundance. And you wield them with a humility that honors your subjects. Theodore inclined his head, acknowledging her words with a grace that was innate to his royal bearing. Yet, beneath the veneer of formality, there was a flicker of surprise, a pleasure found in the unexpected understanding from someone who had crossed the bridge into his world without fear or reservation. Shall we take one last look before we part ways? Theodore suggested, standing and offering his hand to help Nicole rise from her seat. I'd like to walk through this world of color and form with you, just once more. Lead the way, she acquiesced, placing her hand in his with a trust that felt as natural as breathing. Together, they meandered through the gallery, surrounded by the silent chorus of painted canvases. Each artwork whispered stories of love, loss, and beauty, each a testament to the human experience, much like the sketch that Nicole held close to her heart. Look at this one, Theodore said, pausing before a painting of a vast, open sky. It was one of his favorites he'd done. Doesn't it make you feel as though you can accomplish anything, as long as you're willing to dream? Nicole followed his gaze, letting the expansiveness of the scene envelop her. It does, she admitted, her voice soft but filled with conviction. Dreams are the seeds of reality, after all. Indeed, he agreed, turning to face her. And what we've begun here today, do you think it could be the start of a dream coming true? Their eyes met, and the world seemed to hold its breath, waiting for an answer that would shape the canvas of their futures. She looked up at him, her heart tapping a tentative rhythm against her ribcage. I hope so, she replied, her words infused with an honesty that seemed to bridge the distance between their worlds. She watched as he reached into his pocket, producing a small object that glinted in the dim light. For you, he said, extending a delicate silver charm shaped like a palette, its tiny brushes adorned with minute gemstones. A memento, to 
to remember today. Nicole's fingers trembled slightly as she accepted the charm, the cool metal, a stark contrast to the warmth of his hand. It's beautiful, Theodore. Thank you. Her voice was a soft murmur. Promise me something? Theodore's gaze held hers. Anything, she responded softly. Promise that no matter where your art takes you, you'll always carry a piece of today with you. His words were a gentle command, wrapped in the velvet of his noble upbringing. I promise, Nicole affirmed, glancing down at the charm now resting against her palm. With a final look that lingered longer than necessary, Theodore stepped back, his shoulders squared with the duty that awaited him outside these walls. Until next time, then, he said. Until next time, Nicole echoed, watching him disappear into the night. She clutched the charm, feeling the imprint of his touch linger like a whispered secret. Alone now, amidst the silent witnesses of canvas and paint, Nicole pondered the day they'd spent. Her heart fluttered, and she wondered if perhaps she'd been too hasty to turn him away when he'd asked her to a ball. For a man like Theodore, it might be worth it to live life in the limelight. Meanwhile, Theodore walked down the palace corridors, his mind replaying every glance, every word. The way her eyes lit up when she spoke of her passion, the grace with which she moved around the gallery, it all stirred something deep within him, a longing he hadn't known before. Chapter 6 The silence of the gallery was abruptly shattered by the ring of Prince Theodore's mobile phone. He excused himself from Nicole's side with a graceful nod. Excuse me, Nicole, he said, his voice a low murmur that belied the sudden tightness coiling in his chest. Duty calls. Nicole watched him, her brow furrowed in concern as she observed the prince's tall frame stiffen, his eyes widening as he listened to the voice on the other end. James? Theodore's voice was a whisper. What happened? Your Highness, came the voice, strained and urgent there's been an attempt on Prince James's life. You must come at once. Is he, Theodore began, his throat constricting around the words, is my brother alive? Stable, for now, the voice confirmed, though the reassurance did nothing to ease the dread that latched onto his heart like ivy. And Amanda? Also stable, but the doctors are concerned for the child. Understood, Theodore managed to say his voice steady, despite the tempest raging inside him. I am on my way. He ended the call, his mind racing, yet every thought filled with what this could mean, not just for James and Amanda, but for the stability of their nation, for the fragile thread that held their family together. Duty beckoned him, its call more urgent than ever before. Nicole, Theodore said, turning to her with a gravity that drenched his features, there's been another attempt on my brother's life. I need to get to the hospital right away. Of course, Nicole replied. Is there anything I can do? Come with me, he implored, the command soft but firm. Nicole nodded immediately. Of course. She followed him out the door, locking the gallery. He and Nicole were ensconced in the back of a black government sedan rushing toward the hospital where James and Amanda lay. Will they be all right? Nicole asked. I don't know, Theodore admitted, his gaze fixed on the blur of city lights. But I have to believe they will be. Tell me what you need from me, she urged, reaching out tentatively to touch his arm. Just stay with me, he whispered, allowing himself the briefest moment of vulnerability as he turned his hand over to clasp hers. They were ushered through the sliding doors by security into the flurry of activity. Your Highness, a nurse called out, recognition flashing in her eyes, before she bowed her head slightly and rushed away. Have there been any updates? Theodore inquired of a passing doctor, who paused mid-stride. Prince James is stable. He took a bullet to the shoulder, the doctor replied. He was gone before Theodore could ask about Amanda. Theodore scanned the crowded hallway, noting the royal insignia on the doors. He could hear the low murmurs of officials, conversing in hushed voices. 
Your parents, Nicole said under her breath as King Albert and Queen Beatrice appeared through the throng, their faces drawn and pale. Mother, father, Theodore greeted them. Who is this young lady? Queen Beatrice's gaze settled on Nicole, a glimmer of curiosity breaking through her somber mien. Nicole Wintera, the curator of the gallery, Theodore introduced her, feeling the strangeness of intertwining his two worlds. She's been a friend. Ah, the girl in the painting, King Albert remarked with a nod. Are we certain of their safety here? Theodore asked quietly, his eyes scanning the bustle of royal guards stationed around them. Every precaution has been taken, his father assured him. You must be strong for your brother, Queen Beatrice added softly. She rarely left the palace, but her firstborn son and eldest grandchild were at risk. There was no way she would have stayed home. Of course, mother, Theodore replied, though waiting and doing nothing were the polar opposite of what he wanted to do. Theodore stood at the guarded door where James and Amanda were being cared for, and after a brief exchange with the guard, he entered the room. James, Theodore whispered, his voice carrying a weight of relief as he moved to his brother's bedside. Prince James managed a weak smile at the sight of his brother. Theo, he breathed out, his voice a mere thread of sound. You came quickly. Of course, Theodore responded, his hand closing around James's. I would ride through fire to be here for you. Amanda lay on the adjacent bed, her usually vibrant eyes now clouded with fatigue and pain. Theo, she greeted him, her voice steadier than her husband's, but laced with underlying worry. Amanda, Theodore acknowledged her with a tender nod, his gaze filled with concern. How are you feeling? Concerned for our little one, she confessed, her fingers resting protectively on her belly. But grateful we're both alive. Were you shot as well? Amanda shook her head. No, I knocked James down and hit the ground hard, an old habit. I broke a couple of ribs, but I wasn't hit. Thank you for saving my brother, he told her. Have they said anything more about the baby? James's expression darkened. They're monitoring closely, he said, his grip on Theodore's hand tightening. There's been some trauma, and, he trailed off, his voice thick with emotion. Then we must hold fast to hope, Theodore replied, though a cold undercurrent of fear ran through his veins. Always, James agreed. Always, echoed Theodore. As he stood between the beds of his brother and sister-in-law. The gravity of the situation pressed upon him with an almost physical force. Your courage gives us strength, Amanda said, reaching out to place her hand atop theirs. I believe the baby feels it, too. Her pregnancy hadn't even been announced to the public yet. It was still so new. They'd known for only a few weeks themselves. Theodore nodded, his heart swelling with a mixture of love and apprehension. He was acutely aware of the delicate balance of life and duty, of the responsibility he bore not just to his family, but to the nation that looked to them for stability in times of crisis. When he returned to the waiting room, he sat beside Nicole, quietly filling her in on what James had told him. Eloise hurried toward them. Theo, she said, her voice a soft whisper that carried the weight of a kingdom's fears. How is he? Stable. Theodore replied. He briefly told Eloise what James and Amanda had said. He watched as Eloise's gaze drifted to Nicole, standing slightly behind him, a pillar of quiet support amidst the tumult. Nicole, isn't it? Eloise asked. Yet there was something more, a flicker of secrecy that danced momentarily before being tucked away behind a practiced smile. Theodore caught it, an unspoken understanding passing between siblings, but neither addressed it openly. Yes, Nicole answered with a polite nod. And you are Princess Eloise. Please, call me Eloise, she insisted. Theodore admired his sister's ability to maintain decorum even when her heart was surely racing with fear. At the end of the hall, his parents returned. His mother didn't do well in unfamiliar places, so they had taken a walk around the grounds to calm her. 
Mother, Father, Theodore greeted. James is holding on. Thank God for that, King Albert murmured. The Queen's hand sought her husband's, a silent exchange of mutual support. Your Majesty, Nicole curtsied, the formality unfamiliar, yet necessary. Theodore's mind was a mess of worry, waves of duty and desire clashing against each other. Should he distance himself to keep her safe? A while later, Nicole had excused herself for a moment and his parents were visiting with James and Amanda. He and Eloise were alone in the waiting room. Theo, she began, we need to talk about what this means for us all. Theodore nodded, a silent invitation for her to continue. James's attempt, the implications are frightening. The security breach alone will have the council in an uproar. Father is talking about tightening the security, more restrictions, more watchful eyes, Eloise confided. Security measures we cannot avoid, Theodore replied. But there is more at stake than just our freedom. Nicole, she said, her gaze piercing into him, reading his thoughts as only a sibling could. You cannot seriously be considering. I know what must be done, he interjected, his jaw clenching. I cannot, I will not, put her in danger. Eloise reached out, placing a hand on his arm. She's strong, Theo. Stronger than you give her credit for. Strength isn't the shield I wish to give her, he said softly. This isn't a life I can ask her to lead, not with shadows lurking around every corner. Then what will you do? He felt the weight of his next words, each syllable a stone adding to the fortress he would build around his heart. I will end it before it truly begins. I have to keep her safe. Theo, Eloise started, but he raised a hand to stop her. Please, don't make this harder than it already is, Theodore implored. Very well, Eloise conceded. She understood duty, but her dream was to share the responsibilities of duty with someone she cared about. Now Theodore was giving up the ability to do the same. Theodore squared his shoulders, knowing the talk with Nicole must happen, and soon. Theodore found Nicole standing by a window overlooking the hospital's sprawling gardens, her profile etched in the soft light that filtered through the pane. He longed for his easel and paintbrush. He would have to memorize her to bring back her beauty in his mind. Nicole, Theodore's voice, was low. There are things you must know, about the danger that now shadows us. She turned to him. Tell me, Theodore. I can see how upset you are. My brother's life was nearly stolen today. But it's not just about James or the Crown, it's about anyone close to us, anyone who could be used to, to leverage pain. His hands clenched at his sides, a physical manifestation of his internal struggle. The girl in the painting, who is she? Nicole's question cut through his thoughts. Theodore spoke, his voice raw with emotion. What I'm about to tell you is something I've kept hidden beneath layers of oil and canvas. And I must have your promise to not tell a soul. She looked at him curiously. I have painted you, long before we ever met, he confessed, his eyes never leaving the bleak expanse of the overcast sky. I was consumed by the image of a woman who haunted my dreams, a muse that seemed to come from another life. Nicole's breath caught in her throat as she processed his words. Are you Peter Thompson? she whispered. He turned to face her, his green eyes holding a storm of emotions that mirrored the tumultuous skies outside. Yes. I thought a pseudonym would make it, so I could make my way in the art world without people buying my paintings, simply because I'm a prince. Peter Thompson, Nicole repeated softly. The revelation sent a jolt through her, a mix of elation and despair. Every brushstroke was a search for you. Theodore continued. And when I found you, it felt as though destiny had finally unveiled its grand design. His hands clenched into fists at his sides. But now, I must sever what should never have been woven together. My world is one of peril and shadows. To love you is to place you within reach of those shadows. Nicole's mind raced, images of their shared laughter, the warmth of his smile all tainted by the specter of danger that now loomed over them. 
her heart swelled with empathy for the prince who bore the world on his shoulders. Is this why you're pushing me away? Because you're scared for me? she asked. Yes, he admitted, the word tasting like defeat on his lips. It is a burden too heavy to ask you to bear. She wanted to fight, to argue that love was worth every risk, but the look on his face told her she would be wasting her time. Will you still attend your show at the gallery? Nicole asked, hoping against hope she would at least have that opportunity to see him again. Theodore shook his head. No, I can't. That part of my life, Peter Thompson's life, and my connection to you, must be over. Nicole's heart felt as though it might splinter into a thousand pieces. The man she had grown to admire, the artist whose soul had spoken to hers through his paintings, was retreating from her. As she walked away from him, each step echoed hollowly against the linoleum floor. Anger simmered within her, not at Theodore, but at the cruel fate that had brought them together only to tear them apart. Sadness enveloped her, a shroud of what-ifs and could-have-beens. She exited the hospital, stepping out into the chill of the day, alone. The sky above was a tapestry of greys, and as she walked, Nicole wrapped her arms around herself, seeking comfort where there was none to be found. Chapter 7 Prince Theodore's boots echoed off the marble floors, a stark reminder of the solitude he often felt despite the opulence surrounding him. He paused outside Eloise's door, his hand hovering over the ornate handle, and knocking loudly. At her call, he pushed the door open and entered the sun-dappled chamber where his sister sat, surrounded by a fortress of books. Theodore, Eloise greeted. Is there news? Theodore closed the distance between them, his eyes betraying the tumult within. I just need to talk and maybe get some advice, he told her. I'm listening, she replied. Her eyes were filled with concern. It's Nicole, he began. I miss her with everything inside me, even though I know it's not safe for her to be with me. I still think you're giving up too easily, Eloise observed. He turned to face Eloise, a frown etching lines of worry across his brow. These assassination attempts. How can I pursue this relationship and put her in danger? It's what I need, and all I want, but keeping her safe has to be more important. Your heart speaks with conviction, Theodore, Eloise said softly. And yet, you don't listen to it, preferring the familiar chains of duty. He nodded. I am torn. Between the prince I must be and the man I wish to become. I want to tear myself in half, so at least half of me can live the life I choose. Perhaps the pieces of you aren't as different as you believe, she murmured. Love is a force to be reckoned with. Is it enough to shield those I hold dear? Theodore asked. Only time will reveal that truth, Eloise replied. But to deny one's heart is to walk half in shadow. You need to grab hold of your love and never let go. Theodore met her gaze. Then I shall seek the light, even amidst these shadows, he declared. But will Nicole forgive me for sending her away from the hospital? I'm sure she will. I saw how she looked at you, Eloise said with a smile. Now, let's consider what we can do to make your relationship with her easier. Theodore simply paced, thinking about when he should approach Nicole but to put her in danger, it seemed so wrong. Please, sit, Eloise said. You will wear a trench into the floor. He acquiesced, sinking into the plush fabric of an armchair, but he found no comfort in its embrace. The fear for Nicole and his family gnawed at him. It threatened to consume the very essence of who he was, Prince Theodore of Farron, the elusive painter. Tell me what troubles you so deeply, Eloise coaxed. I feel like this all rests on me. Between father's heart attack, and now James being shot, and Amanda injured, I would be next in line to be king, and I have no desire to get anywhere close to the throne. Father is better, Eloise reminded him. And James is stable. You must stop borrowing trouble. Yet how does one choose the right path, he asked. Trust your heart. You always do what you should for the kingdom 
but it's time to do what your heart is begging for, she replied. You painted Nicole for a reason, and you must not ignore the pull of being with her. You need her. You're right, he admitted. But is it right to put my needs above hers? I met her. She feels the same as you do, Eloise said, moving to the window, to peer out onto the palace gardens below. If you need my help through any of this, you just tell me. I have a feeling I would be able to convince her, simply because I better understand where you're coming from. Thank you, he murmured, following her gaze to where the roses bloomed. Remember, Eloise turned back to him, if she truly cares, then she will be amenable to the dangers being with you involves. Theodore exhaled slowly, allowing the truth in her words to settle within him. I think the real answer with Nicole is to have a clandestine relationship until the danger passes, she said. Consider the secret courtships of old, the stolen moments, beneath moonlit balconies. There is a certain charm in secret affections. Theodore's lips quirked upward in a half-smile, imagining himself a hero from the pages of a romance novel. A hidden rendezvous, you say? He mused aloud, allowing the whimsical thought to dance through his mind. Exactly, Eloise affirmed. A love cherished in secret can be all the sweeter for its privacy. Discretion may just shield you both until we resolve these darker matters. Wouldn't that be deceitful? Theodore asked. Sometimes, the greatest truths are those unspoken, Eloise replied. You'd be protecting her heart. Didn't you say she had no desire to be in the limelight anyway? He nodded, slowly. I did. I'll talk to her tonight, and we'll see what she thinks of the idea. Theodore nodded. Nicole should have a say in this. Let love be your light, she said, simply. Love is my light, he repeated softly, the idea settling into him. Your first concern should be Nicole's happiness and safety. Think about how you would feel. Wouldn't you rather have six months of love than live a long life without it? Absolutely. Thank you for talking through all of this with me. It does help. Think nothing of it. She smiled. Now, go. Plan your next move with all the cunning and passion of a romance novel hero. Yes, I will, he promised. Asterisk. Prince Theodore paused beneath the archway that led into the library. The golden hues of the setting sun cast a warm glow on the rows of ancient books, and for a moment, the fear within him dissipated. But only for a moment. Marquis Christopher, Theodore murmured, the name tasting like poison on his tongue. We all know he is behind the assassination attempts, but we can't prove it. Eloise, seated on a plush chaise lounge, with a volume splayed open in her lap, looked up at her brother. We must prove it's him, Theodore. You're right, Theodore agreed, his voice laced with resolve. I have considered every possible angle, every connection that might lead us to him. But I can find no proof. Perhaps shadows are where we should look, Eloise suggested thoughtfully, closing her book with a soft thud. Shadows can only exist where there is light. So we find the source of light, and it leads us to him. Theodore nodded, a silent acknowledgement of her wisdom. Every waking moment I am haunted by the threat he poses, he confessed. Not just to me, but to all whom we love. You have always been my protector, Eloise said. She joined him by the hearth, her proximity a reminder of their shared bond. I would lay down my life without hesitation to keep you safe, Theodore agreed. Marquis Christopher was once James's closest confidant, and now he slithers in the dark, trying to overthrow our monarchy. He will be brought to justice. I shall see to it personally. You need to be cautious. We can't afford to lose you. Of course, he conceded. The weight of his responsibility felt less burdensome. We will proceed with meticulous care. But believe me, I will put an end to these threats. It is my duty as a prince. So, what do you think our first step should be? Eloise asked. Consider the alliances, Theodore mused aloud. 
Marquis Christopher would need Confederates, resources, perhaps even a nation's backing to perpetrate such treachery. Yes, she replied, her voice the whisper of silk against silk. But who would ally against the monarchy? We have a strong approval rating. I would think only a country who wishes to take us over, and the only country that has ever posed a real danger to us is Alenia. Do you think he's gathering allies among the other courtiers? He shook his head. Someone who smiles with teeth sharpened by envy? It could be that Marquis Christopher has a group of allies within Theron, but their movements are guided by the powers that be in Alenia. Foreign influence. He paused. It seems to be the most obvious culprit. Though I thought we were growing closer to better relations with Alenia. I think Prince Bernard has a crush on you. Eloise rolled her eyes. We should have a grand ball then, and I'll ask him. I'm not sure that's the wisest course of action. Let's think about what we know, she said, rising gracefully from her chair. She approached a grand map mounted upon the wall, the expanse of their kingdom etched in fine detail. Her finger traced the borders and trade routes, lingering over the names of neighboring realms. Trade agreements have been honored, mostly, Theodore pointed out. But there were discrepancies, shipments delayed without cause, goods accounted for, but never arrived. And all seemed to have come through Alenia. Patterns, Eloise affirmed, her brow furrowed in concentration. If we can discern a pattern in these irregularities, we might unveil a trail leading to Christopher. I'll gather the list of misappropriated goods as well as the ones that arrived short or damaged. We'll see if we can find a rhyme or reason. We'll cross-reference the trade anomalies with the social engagements from the past months. Social engagements? Eloise queried, turning to face him with a tilt of her head, a lock of red hair slipping free from its confines. Marquis Christopher, whoever he is, would need to move within certain circles to gather information, Theodore explained, his mind tracing paths invisible to the eye. Balls, banquets, things of that sort, occasions ripe for espionage under the guise of celebration. Then we'll make a list, Eloise declared. Every guest, every conversation that struck an odd chord, every glance, misplaced. An excellent plan. For the first time since this last assassination attempt, he felt hopeful they'd find the person behind the unrest. Asterisk. Theodore and Eloise leaned over an ornate mahogany desk strewn with parchment scrolls. The soft glow of candles flickered, casting a warm light that danced upon their determined faces. Here, Theodore said, pointing to a name on one of the lists with a steady hand. Lord Ashford mentioned Marquis Christopher in passing during the summer solstice gala. He seemed, apprehensive. Eloise's eyes narrowed thoughtfully as she traced the inked line with her finger. Yes, and do you recall Lady Witherfork's peculiar interest in the military parades? It was as if she were cataloging more than just the nobles. Indeed. Theodore's jaw tightened. Could it be that these seemingly idle gossips are threads in a larger web of treachery? His mind raced, piecing together fragments of conversation, gestures, and alliances. What of the trade ships? Eloise asked. The ones delayed under suspicious circumstances, could they not be linked? Potentially. Theodore stroked his chin, feeling the roughness of his evening stubble. We must examine the manifests. Cross-reference them with our guest lists. Anyone with interests in those ports could be connected to our marquee or one of his confidants. I'll work on interviewing the guests, seeing if I can find what they know, she affirmed with resolve. Eloise rose from the desk, moving to the window. Teddy, she began, using the childhood nickname that only she dared employ, we cannot allow fear to cloud our judgment nor haste to dictate our actions. We must be meticulous. Patience is a virtue we can scarcely afford, yet I understand your counsel. Theodore joined her by the window. Then let us divide our duties, Eloise suggested. You will take the manifests, and I shall revisit the guests. Agreed. Theodore nodded, his heart lighter. 
We are not mere pawns in this game of shadows. Remember, Eloise said softly, the truth fears no scrutiny. Nor shall we fear the pursuit of it, he replied. Theodore and Eloise retreated from the window. They returned to their respective tasks and delved deeper into the enigma of Marquis Christopher.